It's uh, Chandra Easton from uh, Living in Life, starastrologyhealing.com, uh, speaking to you today about the sign Sagittarius. This is part of the series of teachings on the esoteric um, signs of nature of the signs of the zodiac. <clears throat> so, what I'll, uh, Sagittar the Sagittarian period is when the sun moves through Sagittarius, and it's around about the 21st of November every year until around about the 20th of December. It can be a day either side. Um, I'll be covering a few things. I'll be talking about um, where Sagittarius fits within the um, the evolutionary cycle on the spiritual path. Uh, I'll be talking about how it's known as the lesser gate leading up to the universal signs. I'll be speaking about the exoteric, that's the worldly, and the esoteric, that's the soul uh, rulers. Um, I'll give you a few keywords, um, ways to... Um, Kind of get your head around what Sagittarius is all about. I'll speak about the keynotes. This is um, to do with how the personality uses Sagittarius and how the soul um, inhabits and, and um, works with the energy of Sagittarius. And then finally I'll speak about the, um, the Hercules labor known as the labor the ninth, killing the Stymphalian birds. And this is a teaching that's very relevant to the current times um, despite the fact that it comes from Greek mythology. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, uh, broadly speaking, I think what I'll just um, like to say is that Sagittarius is often depicted as a rider on a horse, sometimes depicted as a centaur, other times de depicted as a flaming arrow. And like all of the signs of the zodiac, there is the lower and higher vibration of how we work or utilise the energy of Sagittarius. From the perspective of ordinary humanity, people who are not yet aware of the fact that they are in essence soul and spirit, then Sagittarius provides great learning and it ushers uh, souls onto the path of aspirancy and progresses them along that path. Hmm. Um, at a higher turn of the spiral, Sagittarius is um, taking us further and in greater contact with our higher self having come out of the um, tests and trials of the sign of Scorpio and prior to entering into the sign of Capricorn. Now, when we are part of ordinary humanity and we have forgotten that we are stardust and that we are uh, souls um, utilising a body for an, a, an Earth experience, then we are moving um, counterclockwise through the signs of the zodiac and we go from Sagittarius and we go back towards Scorpio whereas once we have awoken to the fact that we are in essence souls utilizing a body then the 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 um, turn of everything all aspects of life is reversed on the wheel of life and we then progress clockwise instead of anti-clockwise from the sign of Scorpio which is the great clearing house sign and we find ourselves in Sagittarius. Okay one of the major symbols for the sign of Sagittarius as I said is the horse and in some of the symbols you'll have the centaur who's half human and half animal but you could also say that at a higher turn of the spiral the centaur is half human and half divine. Now when we see a white horse we know that the white horse symbolizes the divinity, the soul in us and the, the spiritual teachings of the sign of Sagittarius are about, about gaining focus. Instead of having a wide angle lens, we need a focused, penetrating um, gaze and lens in order to either move on to the path proper or to progress um, to the next stage of expansion. Now, I have worked um, basically ever since the late 1970s when Chiron was first discovered. I've always worked with the planetoid Chiron. Now Chiron is not a planet in that it does not um, orbit around our sun. It moves between uh, Saturn, the last planet visible to the naked eye, the, which typifies the, symbolises the end of the material world. And it moves out to the planet Uranus, which is the first of the transpersonal planets. And then it loops back into Saturn and back out to Uranus. And so Chiron does what you and I are trying to do, which is create a bridge of living light between our soul, that is the transpersonal aspect of ourselves, represented by Uranus, and our personal selves, our bodies, our ego, um, 
uh, represented by the planet Saturn. So it's always very interesting. Um, and and I mentioned said uh, Chiron because Chiron um, rules. Well, I should say Chiron rules the planet Virgo, but it is in its exaltation in the sign of Sagittarius. This, I won't go too deeply into that. Just suffice it to say that um, Chiron is at its best when it's working to bring spirit into matter through our health and our service. And Chiron is at its at its most visionary when it's in the sign of uh, Sagittarius, the sign of the centaur, the sign of the higher aspirant. Yes. Uh, also, therefore, because um, Chiron is, is at its exaltation in Sagittarius, it is operating under detriment in the sign of Gemini, and it is operating in what we refer to as the fall in Pisces. This is a, a complicated matter, but just think of it as Chiron points out the Achilles heel. What's the weak link between the best that you can be, your higher self, and your most um, worldly um, functioning ego? And the Chiron in your natal chart and everyone's natal chart will indicate the area where attention must be placed. Is that we're looking for the higher truth. This is not my truth or your truth or the truth of the Daily Mail, but the truth from the spiritual perspectives. And the sign of Sagittarius is often referred to as an arrow um, moving, flying towards the divine light of truth. And there's a very strong connection between um, the search for truth and our capacity to take charge of our rational mind. So I'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, we have the subconscious mind, we have the intellectual or the rational mind, we have the higher mind or the intuitive mind, beyond that the buddhic mind, beyond that um, the realms of cosmos, cosmic mind. Our personal selves, the way we're taught in school, unfortunately, is to believe only what, what we can compute and what we can rationalise and what makes sense on a practical level. And we're taught to use the three R's, the reading, writing and the arithmetic, and to, to make that the be-all and the end-all of everything. Uh, however, that's only one part of the equation because we have spirit and matter. So the rational mind is wonderful for dealing with the material world, but really next to useless when it comes to penetrating into the insights of the inner world. Yes, and so the sign of Sagittarius um, is asking us to um, uh, recognise which part of our mind we are using when we make decisions. Are we using the rational mind? Are we using the intuitive mind? Are we contemplating and meditating, opening for inspiration to make a connection with the, the buddhic mind, atmi? Yeah. Um, the soul controls its mechanism. That's the, your physical body. Your higher self controls your life for outcomes that bring the best for you when the mind, the rational mind, the literal mind, the pragmatic mind is brought into service to the higher mind. When the mind that the ego uses serves the heart and serves the higher mind of the soul, then we know that some of the lessons of Sagittarius um, are being learnt and therefore uh, as we learn to um, focus our mind and purify and clean up our mind and this is a huge task because literally we're bombarded from morning to night with advertising and messages and other people's opinions and our own old programs and we have to clear all that clutter out of the way uh, it's known as the lesser gate the first of the universal signs um, seated between the transformative um, cleansing sign of Scorpio and the sign of Capricorn which indicates a significant progress on the path proper. Uh, so yes, the so Sagittarius leading, be, seated as it is between Scorpio and Capricorn, I like to think of it as Scorpio, we go down into the depths, down into the valleys, get down into the caverns, down into the subconscious, into the past lives, we do a lot of 
you know, cleansing and clearing out and um, uh, stripping back of everything that's um, weighing us down, that's, that's um, giving our ego power. And then we come out into the light of day and we follow the aspirational arrow of the sign of Sagittarius so through the foothills in the direction of the mountains. I've never really been a mountain climber. Um, I have aspirations to be a mountain climber and to go into uh, Nepal and uh, Tibet and um, the high, high mountains. They're represented by the sign of Capricorn. The sign of Sagittarius is the um, foothills that lead to the sign of Capricorn. So the tests are there, but they're not as arduous, they're not as difficult, but at least you can see them up ahead of you, unlike uh, the sign of Scorpio, where we're, you don't know what will be dug up. Um, Yes, so we're following the arrow, the bow and arrow of the archer. We're following the rider on the white horse. Uh, we're moving towards greater clarity. Uh, the, the rider on the horse is the soul in control of the personal self, following the arrow of inspiration. Uh, the exoteric ruler of um, Jupiter, if we're exoteric ruler of Sagittarius, sorry, if we're using Sagittarius in a worldly capacity is the planet Jupiter. And the, uh, the keynote for the planet Jupiter is let food be sought. Uh, to me this means that we can fill ourselves with everything that the earth has to offer us on a physical, on a worldly, on a material, on a, uh, a sexual, on a sensual, on a... a uh, money level on a on a um, pride level, but but does it fill us? Is that the food of the soul? Not necessarily. Of course, we all go through those phases in our lifetimes, following um, the exoteric broad path, as it's called, of Sagittarius. But uh, and and the rays, and I won't go deeply into the rays because it's too large a subject. But I uh, I just say that the if we're following the broad exoteric path of Sagittarius, then we're following the fourth, the fifth, and or the sixth ray. The fourth ray of conflict through harmony, the fifth ray of trying to discern what's real and what's unreal, and the sixth ray of um, really deciding what is it that we hold dear and uh, what is it that we will aspire to above all else. Eventually, having gone through this, the, the cleansing clearing house of Scorpio and um, moved from the anti-clockwise to the clockwise direction uh, we arrive at the sign of Sagittarius we either arrive at it um, in pre preparation to take the first great leap forward the first initiation or maybe further along down the path but either way when we arrive at it um, Sagittarius then is ruled by the earth now the earth is um, completely missing in traditional astrology and is only used um, in esoteric astrology and it is the degree and the sign and the degree and the minute directly opposite your sun. So if you're a Sagittarian then your earth, the planet you're standing upon, living and breathing upon is the sign Gemini. Um, if you're a Leo then your earth is in the sign of Aquarius, it's always directly opposite. What the earth represents is a point of dharma, a point of integration, a point of synthesis where your higher self can use the best that you have accumulated in your lifetimes upon earth uh, to serve um, the world, to make the world a better place, to serve humanity. Uh, so it's extremely important that you understand the earth in your chart. Uh, and of course the earth... Yeah. Okay, so all Sagittarians have the the um, the Dharma point, the Earth in Gemini, and the need to find a way of bridging uh, the heart, the speech, and the mind. The esoteric keynote for the sign of Sagittarius, which applies to all of us, whether or not we've got the Sun in Sagittarius, although it's more important if you have the Sun there or the Ascendant there or the Moon there, is I see the goal. I reach that goal and then I see another. And this keynote of looking to the far horizons and aspirationally moving with great speed but focus speed towards that goal until we reach that goal and then not stopping there but looking again to the far horizon to the next goal and remembering that these goals are goals of the soul. 
goal, and the goals of the soul can be broadly defined as those things which bring us on rapport with our higher self. Goals of self-healing, meditation, goals of higher study, our goals of service to others, cleansing and purifying our karma, whatever they may, that, that may be, or a goal of doing something that contributes to the world, that makes the world a better place. Um, Sagittarians who are uh, um, affiliated or um, in touch with their soul, uh, they, they respond to vision, inner vision or outer vision. Yeah? Uh, and the, the one-pointed aspirant, that is the Sagittarian approaching the path proper, becomes eventually the archer riding upon the horse of the personality, going straight forward to the goal, whatever it is that your soul has said. The, the esoteric um, ray for uh, the earth, for, for Sagittarius, is the third ray. This is the third ray of active intelligence, where we work actively and intelligently from the heart in the world. People have the third ray strong, have many projects on the go, often have a lot of tests and trials associated with money. Uh, and, and in the highest um, expression of the third ray, I would say that uh, there's a relationship with the Holy Mothers of the Earth and a capacity to bring healing to humanity and to the Earth. You'll find um, those with the third ray in many walks of life. Yes, but uh, it is the Earth that is important, uh, the planet Earth that is important, and being able to focus, because focus is the key issue for Sagittarians, and the greatest danger, for if you have a lot of Sagittarius, is that you'll go off in many directions simultaneously and not do anything well. The greatest danger from the personal perspective is that you will follow a, a false leader idealistically and get involved in all kinds of conflict and have some sort of distortions of truth. Okay, I shall leave that now and move on to the labour of Hercules, known as the killing of the Stomphalian birds. Yeah, killing, you could think of it as um, transmuting or um, transforming. And I'll read you... Uh, a brief um, story of the test that Hercules, who was the world aspirant, who became the world disciple, and what is it that he needed to overcome within himself through this labour the ninth. So from the old um, commentary, we have the words that Hercules now stood at the ninth gate, and the task ahead was to find the marsh of Stymphalius and rid it of the birds that dwelt there wrecking havoc. He searched and at length came to the marsh and saw the huge screeching birds. They were hideous, large and fierce, with iron beaks sharpened like swords, feathers like steel shafts and talons to match. When they rose, they blocked out the sun. Hercules sought for a way to rout them. He took two cymbals that sounded with a screeching, unearthling sound, blocking his ears and he waited until twilight when the birds were still. The dissonant clanging and dinning of the cymbals disturbed the birds who rose wildly, confused and in a disarray. They flew off, never to return. Silence returned. Okay, so let's examine some of the um, aspects of this, this um, training and this test and this teaching for those with Sagittarius. We have to find the marsh of Stymphalus. Now the marsh is an astral word. Yeah? and rid it of the birds that were there. Now, the birds represent thought, negative thought, um, erroneous thought, the thought of the ego, the mental chatter. Now, the fact that the birds, the mind, the mental, are living in the marsh indicates to us that our thoughts are distorting and, and um, confusing and colouring our emotions. And they're getting in the way of... Hercules, either the higher aspirant or the disciple, moving on to the next mountain, the next great soul expansion. So Hercules came and found where they were screeching. Yeah? So, so the birds, the mind, the voice of the ego, becomes very strident and very screeching. It's described as hideous and large 
and fierce with iron beaks. These are not mild-mannered birds. This is a screeching and an attempt to harm us through the mind. Their beaks were like swords. Now, we have to be very careful with the mind that we don't harm ourselves or harm others and become sword-like in our speech or our thoughts. Even the feathers were steel shafts and they had talons to match. So every aspect of the mind is acting, you would say, as a weapon against Hercules. So the first point to recognise and to contemplate is where is it that your mind is attacking you and sabotaging you and acting like a weapon against you and blocking your path to soul connection and soul service. When they rose, they blocked out the sun. Well, the sun is a wonderful symbol for the soul. So if they're allowed to sort of carry on regardless, then eventually we're disconnected from our higher self. So Hercules decides that's it, he's going to get rid of them. And he chooses two symbols that sounded and made a screeching, unearthly sound. So he's got to choose a note or a sound from a different dimension. I would suggest that the sound that we're looking for, um, well, it can be anything that's not verbal. Yeah? It could be a musical sound. It could be a, a mantric sound. It could be a sound of silence. It could be the sound of nature. But we have to recognise that the ego is attempting dis to disrupt you on your path of spiritual growth via the mind. And then we have to tune the mind down and tune the higher sounds, nature, music, um, uh, silence that comes from into contemplation, into con contemplation, turn it up. Um, now, Hercules had to block his ears. Yeah? It takes a great deal of effort to shut the mind and the voice of the ego out because it's had its way in controlling you for a long time. So he waited until twilight. He's aligning himself to sunrise and sunset. So to me, that, that says pick a time for your spiritual practices. Could be sun, sunrise or sunset uh, where the world is going to bed. That's what sun, the sunset means. The material world is passing away and the inner world is opening. Now, most people who meditate understand that it is easier to meditate first thing in the morning, last thing at night. And the reason for that is that the ethers, the inner worlds, are quieter uh, as um, the outer chatter of the material world with all its thought forms um, falls into silence. Yes, yeah, so I've got to pick a time when the birds are still. Yeah? This could be asking for help during your meditation. It could be prior to sleep. So he, he uses the symbols. Whatever symbols you decide to use, you have to use them repeatedly. He clangs and dins the symbols. So if you're going to use a mantra, don't just use it once. Use it for a year or more. If you're going to use a nature to bring in a peace and quiet and contemplative space, do it regularly. Yeah, whatever it is you choose, your symbol, to um, uh, create space, inner space, Make it a regular practice. The end result of this is that the birds rose wildly and they were confused and in disarray. Many, many people find that when they pursue their spiritual practice, an aspect of themselves becomes very confused, very, very disarrayed. They don't know who they are anymore. They don't know what to think. The, 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 the power of the rational mind has been disrupted by the note, the higher note of the soul, and confusion is often the result. So if you're feeling confused and in disarray, I take that as a very good sign that you're moving in the right direction to unseat the wild birds of your mind from having power over you and blocking your path to spiritual awakening. Eventually, these um, vicious birds flew off, never returned. Now, if you start meditating and you expect to enter into bliss in three months or six months or a year or three years and it doesn't happen, well, it's because the birds have been in control for a lot longer than that. You need to persist with the contemplative practices until 
the birds fly off, the, the mind leaves you in peace, however long this takes. If this is the first lifetime that you've attempted to do this, it could take years, decades. If, if this is a practice that you have had from other lifetimes, it may take a lesser period of time. Persistence until the inner silence um, dominates, until the inner si silence overtakes. That's the lesson. Okay, so in a nutshell, the lessons of Sagittarius are restraint of speech, don't give voice to negativity. Through control of your thoughts. Witnessing your thoughts but refusing to give them the power of your speech. Eventually what this does is um, erode old belief systems, old attitudes, old programs. The power of the mind is, is worn away. Just, the way, just like uh, the ocean will eventually wear away a cliff. Yeah? There's an attrition of the old programs. This takes effort. We don't know whether it's going to take you um, a year, a decade, or the rest of the incarnation. But the sooner you start working with the bringing your mind, the wild, vicious birds of Stymphalia, under control, the sooner your higher self will breathe a great sigh of release, re relief. Sagittarius is known as the sign of silence. And in the ancient mysteries, the candidates for admittance had to, had to keep silence until they understood right speech. I, I still remember to this day uh, the first um, um, Vipassana meditation that I went on, uh, where the, the order of the day was to be silent for a week. I nearly went bananas. My mind, my ego, nearly went bananas. Eh? My ego likes to talk and to think and to interchange and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, so I'd chosen a week of enforced silence. But eventually what happened towards the end of that week was there was a great inner sigh happened, a deep relief, a deep sense of thank goodness for that. So, of course, it's wonderful if we can take a week off. Yeah? You can make great strides in a whole week of silence that you that might take a year to make in another point in your life. But if you can't take a, a, a week off, maybe you have to take a weekend off, take a day off, at least, at the very least, have your daily practices of inner silence, contemplation, meditate, concentration and meditation. Now, of the birds, the, the thoughts that cause the most harm, the ones that cause the most harm are cruel gossip, unnecessary speech about the self, or the casting of pearls before swine. Now, you may find one or the other of these um, harder to bring under wraps. You know, silence. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Yeah? Talking unnecessarily about the self. This could be praising the self or denigrating the self or just dominating the floor space. Yeah? So practice silence and mindfulness. And and the the other, the third of the three birds is recognising when it's foolish to speak about a certain subject in a certain arena because you're wasting your breath. The, the people you're speaking to, the audience, are simply not there. And of course, we have a lot of um, discussion around this with social media and the fact that we speak to people who agree with us um, in social media, generally speaking, and we don't then get the practice of, of speaking respectfully to those who hold a different point of view, who disagree. Yeah? And of course, there's a lot of, what do they call it, sledging online, gossiping and cruelty and, and um, people feel they have license to let fly their mind and their speech through social media. Yeah? Other people feel that they would like to try and convert someone with their idea, their view, their whatever. So just ask yourself, am I engaging in cruel gossip? Am I speaking unnecessarily about myself? Or am I speaking in a way that is really a waste of breath casting pearls before swine? It's important to remember that words are potent. They are words of power. And the goal really is to strive for ahimsa, 
and to try and bring under, under wraps um, moment by moment, day by day, month by month, year by year, decade by decade, negative critical thoughts, self-pitying thoughts, gossip. There is much food for thought in this teaching of the sign of Sagittarius. I hope you find it useful. And of course, um, please remember that this is what I do in my life, is I um, work with people to assist them to understand their own esoteric astrology their natal map but of course i have worked as an astrologer for more than four decades so i have um, um, lots of experience with worldly matters financial matters i'm a medical astrologer um, relationships you name it i can speak to you about it um, if you'd like to have an update on your chart or if you've never had your esoteric astrology chart done, or if you're looking for it to understand something about career changes or uh, travel, uh, relocation, all of those matters, please get in touch with me, Chandra Easton at starastrologyhealing.com, Living in Light. That's all for now. Bye.